to modern energy, and it more lack access to reliable energy, energy that is available when needed. 95% of this group live in sub-Saharan Africa or in the developing economies of Asia. If you look at livelihoods at the bottom of the pyramid, the need for energy along with appropriate technology can be fairly great. In India alone, there are millions of small scale blacksmiths, potters, weavers, and farmers with existing tools, techniques, and resources are laborious and treasury grown, which enable their growth and productivity. With access to clean and modern forms of energy, they can upgrade their livelihoods, expand their enterprises, diversify their services, and improve their incomes. For each livelihood solution, an end user has four aspects, which can turn productivity increase into income increase. One is technology that is efficient and appropriate for the entrepreneur's need. Two is financing that matches the cash flow of the entrepreneur, allowing him or her to pay for the machine and build assets over a period of time. Three is appropriate market linkages. And four is appropriate training or capacity building to operate systems. <coughs> Livelihood improvement is critical to poverty alleviation. Sustainable energy can be that catalyst. Decentralized sustainable energy is a powerful tool to build and mobilize the missing gaps in the livelihood ecosystem. To create conditions in which opportunities for entrepreneurship thrives and incomes improve while addressing climate resilience. In a world that's having nearly half of its population, that's more than 3 billion people, live on a less than 175 rupees or just two and a half dollars a day, it's increasingly become a need to look at how sustainable energy can be used to improve their livelihood opportunities in order to get them out of the bottom of the pyramid. It's indeed a privilege to be a part of a room that's filled with champions from various development sectors from across the globe, gathered to discuss thoughts, learnings, share ideas, network and motivate each other on this spot of change and development. We hope that the event provides a platform for all of you who are present here, a diverse group of stakeholders, right from end users, livelihood practitioners, financial institutions, productive use technology innovators, energy access enterprises, and many more, to help create an ecosystem that allows for the poor to rise out of poverty. We officially welcome you all to the two-day conference, SDG 7 for SDG 8, Sustainable Energy and Livelihood Nexus, that aims to bring forward the importance of sustainable energy in developing livelihood interventions at the grassroots level that shall lead to inclusivity and democratization of wealth distribution. This day will have three main panels. One would be on sustainable energy access models for livelihoods and need-based technology. Second would be on energy efficient appliance manufacturing. These would be the first half of the day in the main auditorium. Post lunch, 2.30 to 3.30, we would have two parallel roundtable discussions in two different classrooms. One to reflect on the current ecosystem for irrigation for small and marginal farmers, and the other on last mile refrigeration and cold storage. Simultaneously, we will also be having live demonstrations by the various entrepreneurs of their respective livelihood products and innovations where the participants really would get the opportunity to understand the role of technology and also the finance uh, and how it has become viable for them, market linkages they explore, the challenges they continue to face and many other factors that goes into making the business effective. We would have the last panel for the day at 4 o'clock that would be on the role of last mile energy, clean energy enterprises and scaling sustainable livelihoods. So this is how really the day would look like. Before we go ahead and officially welcome everybody to this event, some general instructions for these two days. As you all know, 
all your dignitaries have a packed schedule. Respecting that, it's a humble request to everybody to cooperate and adhere to the schedule and timings of each event so that we can really sail through. Drinking water would be available right outside both the exits. The closest washrooms is on my left side here on this exit. In the welcome kit that you guys have got, there's a bag that has been provided. It contains a concept note, agenda for the days, consisting of a map that can help you get through the demonstrations, and a notebook that has the bio of all our speakers. If you need any assistance or help, you can get hold of our volunteers. They will be having a red patch. Good uh, Now I'd like to call upon Harish Hande, founder and CEO of Psycho Foundation, to officially welcome you all for this. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for coming. As you know, uh, it was predicted that it might today might be the hottest day uh, uh, of Bangalore, uh, reaching 37. Uh, the question is, uh, we are in a in a and when you keep hearing from my father or people who've been staying in Bangalore for many years, oh, this never used to happen. Last year was cooler. Two years here was cooler. Next year we'll also say how this year was cooler. The question is, we are in unprecedented times of we all talk about climate change. We all talk about saying that uh, uh, if there are droughts, there are floods. But as you know very clearly, many of us, most of us sitting here, on, on here, are actually not facing the brunt immediately for our own livelihoods. If you have droughts in Central Karnataka, you or in uh, in Maharashtra, floods in Upper Assam, say, and and the and the whole cyclone in East Africa, to what you call about the. Uh, uh, the typhoons of Philippines, the increasing we see for the most vulnerable segment that actually is taking the brunt of all this is the poor. And today what's happening is we all talk about getting people out of poverty. And in the name of poverty, what we are doing is we are creating lots of skills programs to actually make sure that the poor start working for us. And that's injustice. Because if you look at the 600 million people who are poor and we want to create skills for them in, in an ITI or a motor winding machine or etc. Yes, that is required. But we also should not confuse between financial poverty and, and intellectual poverty. There are numerous innovators, there are entrepreneurs, there are thought processors, there are philosophers in the vernacular crowd. As we keep saying, in a country like India, who gets the money? PowerPoint, Excel and more. Non-English speakers or the vernacular crowd have actually no chance. Who we all will speak English, will graduate from an institute like I am or an IIT or anywhere else, we would get failure month. We would get, oh, boss fail, IIT ka hai fail, it's the market failure, not his failure. If a poor man fails, it's his failure, not the market failure. Right? We need to change the traction of the way we speak and we need to create equivalent ecosystem for the poor that we, we all enjoy ourselves. Today, when we talk about innovations, we talk about innovations only for the top 1% of the world. Like, okay, boss, when you talk to a young graduate from an IIT or engineering school, when you talk about innovations, what's your new one? It's a new app, which is based on Apple or Android. Today, the innovations is what we require for the livelihood population for the bottom 40, 50, 60%, whether it's a blacksmith blower or a silk weaver or a, or a roti rolling machine. That's where true innovation. But if you go, a lot of the students don't get excited because that's not something that will get you a job on your resume. Can you, I worked on a roti rolling machine. A lot of the companies do this, so what? I think we need to break that injustice and we call it racism in a pure form towards the poor. And we need to actually be much more bold in our decision making, right from the government to the NGOs to the stakeholders. We need to be more critical and thinking inwardly that what are we all actually striving towards and what type of ecosystem are we creating for the, for the poor of this country or the poor of the world? Can India take the leadership of creating solutions for the rest of the world? And that's when we thought, last year we had a conference on failures where we wanted everybody to bold enough to come and say what their failures are. It's not that fellow failed, that fellow failed, that's why I failed. Was I failed, that's why that fellow failed. Should have been the reverse. So the youngsters can be bold enough that celebrate failures is what the agenda was last year. So this year we thought, how can sustainable energy and livelihoods go together? Because today when people talk about sustainability and livelihoods, a parallel like, oh, let India first develop and then let's look at clean energy. No, both needs to work together as complementary efforts and in a manner that we can show to the rest of the world a sustainable development that is truly inclusive can actually happen. And that was the theme of this place and I'm very glad that we're all here together to debate and please be critical because 
being diplomatic is not going to serve. We are all one way, our voices are the people who couldn't be here, who do not make the decisions. And so let's be bold enough and take, take in, a, in a manner, create processes that the poor can decide, not decide for the poor. Create processes that the poor can then decide and become innovators and entrepreneurs. So thank you so much for coming. First of all, I, I would thank everybody. Thanks the uh, people who are behind it at the last of last day when most of us are not here. I would thank all my colleagues who have actually created this uh, uh, whole event and have been asked me to shut up and say I should not speak. And unfortunately, I spoke. And I thank first all my colleagues who have actually done this wonderful efforts to have. <laughs> And all the colleagues who have come from far and wide, right from Amsterdam to from, from New York to Delhi to uh, Haveri to Bellari to Tumpur, who have all come in here and from IIM. And so I'm very, very glad and thank you so much. And before I go on, I would I would request Dr. Ravinam to who is the director of Indian Institute of Management, who been very kind enough to host us uh, multiple years here to give us such a wonderful campus food, lunch, uh, auditorium, and uh, the director might not know, many of the professors have, have been working with us on these issues and have been excellent in actually being a sounding board of the way that we could actually take the policies forward. Please, I would welcome you, sir. Hi, good morning to all of you. And uh, welcome to this uh, beautiful campus I am Bangalore. Uh, I don't know how energy efficient we are. Uh, so I think we've been trying to do a little bit on our own. Uh, but firstly, uh, Mr. Harish Pandey and uh, our uh, other guests here, uh, Mr. Uh, Atik, who's Principal Secretary of uh, Rural Development and Panchayat Raj of uh, Government of Karnataka, Mr. Ramanan, who's come in from uh, Niti Ayo, uh, the Assistant Secretary uh, looking after the Atal Innovation Mission, uh, Hema, who's the Chair of the Center for Public Policy, which is uh, co host of this event, and uh, I'm sure <coughs> other colleagues and in some ways worked uh, towards this. First of all, I must thank uh, Selco in a way for, you know, enabling this kind of an event uh, because I think it sensitizes us. Uh, last year was, I think, the first and uh, I was just wondering whether it was an annual event. In fact, he said, thanks to the director for hosting all this. Well, let me tell you the, the nice thing about this institution is on many dimensions, it is quite de directorized So, you know, I also hear about this event much like, you know, you all hear about it, but we are happy to provide uh, facilities for, you know, such uh, kind of events. Uh, I think this uh, topic of, uh, you know, the whole idea of uh, sustainable energy and uh, livelihoods, looking at the sustainable development goals uh, 7 and 8, uh, which are directly addressing this is extremely important. Of course, I know I haven't done too much on these uh, domains, but seeing the topics, well, somewhere where I've looked at something in a related context, just a few thoughts. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that the genesis of this institution uh, by when our first director, uh, Mr. Ramaswamy, uh, some of you may have heard of him. Uh, he, you know, wanted to give a public policy, public sector orientation to this institution. And one of his pet research areas was how to bring in efficiency in the bullet art. And uh, I think in terms of impacting uh, the nation, in, you know, uh, in fact, for the first time, somebody was even measuring how many ton kilometers in the country moves by bullet carts as opposed to trucks or uh, railways or you know whatever else and how come nobody has really applied their mind to harness that bullock energy uh, in a more efficient way. More, uh, well recently I have been looking at uh, cold chains 
and that would be an example where we may need to actually provide more access and make more energy available uh, especially in the context of rural uh, in the rural economy including agriculture uh, so that overall <coughs> effectiveness of the output uh, losses and whatever else comes down because i think the way it is it's really a low hanging fruit because i think the more energy we supply what we're going to say is a lot more we are, we are still at that stage and that needs to be done you know in a in a proper and more organized way uh, of course talking of large systems i mean though this uh, we're talking livelihoods and all that but i can tell you that and especially uh, maybe niti ayo can look at some of this um, I, just one area that i'm a little more familiar with is railways uh, which is a big, of course, energy consumer. I mean, transport sector as such is a big energy consumer, and uh, uh, within that railways, of course, there is a general thrust now. We don't want diesel; we go for electricity. Uh, they have said that entire railway system is going to get electrified uh, because at least electricity has access to uh, renewable sources of energy, while diesel is not so. Uh, of course. Railways itself needs to be promoted a lot more <coughs> simply because frictional losses uh, by rail is the best. Uh, it may not have been what the original inventors of railways thought about, but uh, rail technology where the steel wheel moves on a steel rail is about the best in terms of friction and therefore, you know, we must sort of promote rail. But more importantly, I think the real big impact is where we need to do more innovative things, more R&D, because a large guzzler of energy in transportation is the overhead weight we have to carry to move what we actually want to move. So whether we want to move passengers, what is the weight of the bus or the weight of the railway coach, when we want to move uh, goods, what is the weight of the railway wagon that is sort of, we haven't done enough R&D and if we see developed countries, that extra weight is significantly lower than what in India we have been as a legacy continuing. And that's a major area for research that, uh, you know, the railways have to be doing. Now, I would hope this is a large system energy, uh, you know, optimizing scope. But I would hope in the process, the R&D will also spread to small and medium enterprises who will supply be it in the trucking segment or be it in the rail segment where this overhead weight uh, can potentially be reduced. And you know, we just need new technologies, new parts, uh, new materials. Uh, and there again, there is an opportunity, I would hope, in terms of livelihood and So well, with some of these thoughts, let me uh, welcome you all again here and uh, wish you all the best for the uh, two days of uh, interaction and sharing that uh, I hope, uh, you know, will be provided here. Thank you very much. Now, I would li like to uh, introduce, uh, see, I'm not going to talk about uh, where they come from, where they studied. You can look at their bios. Uh, um, the next speaker is uh, Principal Secretary and Secretary of Rural Development, Government of Karnataka. You might not remember, but uh, many, many years ago, uh, two decades, nearly two decades ago, when he was the DC of, uh, of Karwa, it's the first time we had an interaction. And when he said that, uh, uh, why can't Selco come and do a solar water heater for one of the government officers? And then uh, then we had said, and then we didn't do anything. And then he said, why are you not doing? Sir, uh, government, sir, uh, difficult payment will not come. <laughs> then he said, well, I'm paying you 100% advance. And and that was what, I mean, his, his reputation in Karnataka, if people Google has, you know, is very um, a, a person who has looked at rural development has been a DC of multiple districts of, of Karnataka over the years. Recently, has pushed, I think, in the last four five years on on issues of water in many parts of the drier uh, parts of the country. In many ways, um, he uh, he has. And what happened was, uh, every time so we were talking, we I think sabko pagarna sir, bahut saal hogya karte. We not caught hold of him, and we need to get him into this. And then finally, when chance had it that we met in Delhi uh, in the airport that too while before, the Abito Fazgar sir, Abito, 
So we'll, this is the time to catch you forever. And so we thought this is an event and uh, it was a pleasure and honor. I know uh, the Chief Secretary has called for a meeting and he has actually asked somebody to represent him and come here. And so it's so grateful for you to come here, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Please, if you can give us, uh, you know, from a government perspective, Good morning to all of you. Good sir, Aguram, Director of IM Bangalore. Uh, when Arish uh, asked me to speak on this subject, I, I asked him uh, uh, what is the subject. So, uh, livelihoods and sustainable energy, connection between energy and livelihoods. It seems too technical for me. One of bureaucrats, uh, the, generally the reputation of the IAS officers uh, is that we can speak on any subject. And uh, which is generally. Uh, which means we can generally speak on the surface and we don't know, but I was very reluctant, so I had a long conversation with him as to what is it that I should speak. But I still so I thought about this subject and <clears throat> still decided that I will not venture into getting into technical uh, details of this subject because it is not my uh, arena. My area is uh, policy and program implementation. And uh, I will approach the subject uh, from uh, that perspective. Uh, livelihoods and energy have a very strong nexus. It goes without saying. Uh, you can't, uh, a barber cannot run his barber shop without the electricity. He needs an electric razor these days. Uh, he needs electricity to light his saloon. You, a carpenter uh, cannot, uh, like everybody needs energy. So energy and livelihoods is something that uh, we don't need to uh, discuss uh, too much. There is an excess and then uh, and the issue of access to uh, the inequitable access to energy is also well known to all of us. More than 1.2 billion people uh, lack access to sustainable and affordable energy. And uh, I think equal number of people also depend on biomass uh, for their daily livelihoods, for their fuel needs and their fodder needs and uh, <coughs> and Biomass is also a disappearing commodity and because we are not using biomass sustainably. So that is an issue and therefore poverty which is a multi-dimensional uh, issue, multi-dimensional concept. Uh, people who are uh, even at the same levels of income who are probably uh, less poor when they were in an ecosystem which was not as uh, impoverished as today. So if you are a villager and if you are in a village, I come from a village, uh, just uh, incidentally so happened that day before yesterday I was, I went back to my village, uh, I tweeted about it uh, while on, on a tour and I find, I find that the, uh, the landscape of my village has changed so much, it used to be green, uh, I know I am not being romantic or nostalgic about it but actually it, was, it used to be uh, greener. There used to be water uh, in, in, we have a very large tank, there used to be water in the tank even during summer and the end of the summer the water would disappear and you would go into the tank to fish, basically when uh, we call it looty, generally everybody in the village goes to goes to the tank and because there is very little water and a lot of fish and then we catch the fish and now the tank uh, it is, it is full of weeds and uh, it is silted up. And I asked the people, uh, does it fill up ever? It says very rarely does it fill up. Every year it is to fill up. So the ecosystem has impoverished. Even at the same levels of income, people are poorer because now they have to travel longer distance uh, to uh, get water, to get fuel, to get fodder, and to get fish. And therefore, there is a <clears throat> there are nexuses between energy and livelihood, energy uh, ecosystem, livelihoods and ecosystem poverty, all these things are, and therefore any intervention <coughs> has to be, uh, has to be, uh, has to address these nexuses, that's number one. Number two, there is a very strong nexus between water and energy. Now if water was stored in, in again, in, uh, you are in a state, uh, Karnataka is a state which is known for the network of 
irrigation uh, tanks which were which, which have been built over centuries and they have been built with a lot of scientific thought behind them and today we are supposed to be more much more advanced in science and then we have destroyed that network of uh, tanks what used to happen is when we were young when, when uh, during monsoon if one tank fills up it overflows and then that water will go into the river and it will go to the next tank and then that will overflow and over a period of 3-4 months most of the tanks would get filled, filled up and if you are able to if you are able to harness water and keep it at the at surface then you don't need electricity to lift it now what is happening is that number one these water bodies are destroyed they are all centered up the water courses that uh, uh, take water into uh, into these tanks have been centered up or enclosed or diverted railways and roads may have built and therefore water bodies are not getting filled up and the, uh, the surface water bodies would recharge the groundwater and because uh, uh, geologists tell me, hydrogeologists tell me that water is one, there is no surface and groundwater, it's a one resource. So, from the surface water, it, uh, your groundwater aquifers would get recharged. Now, we have started attacking the groundwater aquifers and now in, uh, in the surroundings of Bangalore, we are drilling 1200 to 1500 feet to get water. So, first of all, you didn't need energy to lift water because it was available at the surface. Then we started drilling bore wells. We used to lift water uh, from a depth of uh, 100 to 200 feet, and you didn't need so much electricity. We still needed some electricity, but not much. And now we are extracting water from 1,500 feet. Look at the amount of energy that is required. So the demand for energy uh, has gone up, and the issue of, of access to energy will continue to remain the same. If you are poor, you don't get electricity connection. It's very costly to get electricity connection, and the you, you cannot afford uh, electricity charges. In Karnataka, farmers get free electricity, and as a result, we just have pump water uh, out of and uh, uh, water is becoming uh, groundwater aquifers are going extinct, they are going dry. So uh, that again is imposing costs and poverty, poverty on people. So what do we really do? Uh, on the issues of uh, energy efficiency, of course, uh, Harish made a very valid point that there is not enough innovation in uh, in uh, technologies that the poor use. Uh, when we were uh, when we were young, we used to see that uh, people bend down and uh, use a pickaxe to uh, dig the earth. Even today, we are doing the same thing. Whereas Western uh, cultures, they shovel, they stand up erect and uh, shovel them. So I don't know why we have not uh, changed those technologies. We still bend down uh, and uh, do what is called uh, literally the back backbreaking work. So there is not enough innovation uh, in in uh, systems. Probably there are economic reasons. Probably there is no there is, uh, market is not there for for these technologies. And this is the feel that uh, we need to work and you are you, uh, working and secondly there is not enough attention being paid uh, to uh, look at ecosystems which are uh, destroyed which uh, and uh, so how do we really replenish these ecosystems how do we save water uh, we go back to you know ancient wisdom uh, 100 years ago we used to save water and today our uh, tanks are uh, silted up so what, what, what do we do to uh, again go back to water and so therefore we are in fact in Aga, uh, in, uh, I have started a program in my department uh, which is government wide is to start again talking about water literacy. You talk about water literacy uh, at every village panchayat level and talk to the people because when we go to the villages uh, this is a near, near enough, there is no water to drink. And then we, I, the other day I went to Chikbalapur, it's a very dry district, like after rain I went, there's a lot of water everywhere, but it just comes and it just goes. Then we spoke to the people and uh, asked them, so why are they not able to hold the water in your own village? Why are these water courses uh, silted up and why, is there, why, why are there so many, uh, so many weeds in this? Why can't you do something about it? general lack of uh, 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 general apathy among people as to how to uh, that we need to care for water as a resource this is something that you just drill a bore well you used to get now we are not able to get and then the only uh, solution we are finding is to drill deeper 
So one is that water is because I'm uh, uh, moving slightly away from energy into in, into water because I find that there is a very strong connection between uh, uh, energy uh, energy and water. Then energy and biomass and water and biomass are also related. So we need to we are now thinking in terms of again going back to uh, looking at biomass and uh, promote afforestation, promote tree planting so that we can we have a lot of biomass and from biomass again we can do energy. So we have done experiments with biomass based energy, gasifiers uh, we have done. Uh, unfortunately they are not sustained because in, in, in our state we had a UNDP project where we uh, promoted planting of biomass in farmers fields harvested that biomass and then put it in gasifiers and from gasifiers we uh, generated power but these systems uh, have not become commercially viable and therefore they have not become uh, sustainable so we do need to look at uh, innovation we do need to look at technologies which which can address these issues which can be issues of address uh, issues of water issues of biomass and issues of livelihood a lot of innovation actually happens at the village again uh, from the point of uh, uh, from the point of the water resource. We three years ago in Karnataka we started a program called Krishi Bhagya where we uh, start uh, giving support to the farmers to do a farm pond, something like a 30 feet by 30 feet by 10 feet uh, uh, pond if you dig in your farm. And then during monsoons, uh, if you clear the water channels, water gets stored. Then, but then there is a evapor transpir uh, transpiration and therefore what uh, we started supplying uh, shade nets and also uh, we started using tarpaulin uh, to line the uh, pond so we are able to collect so much water and uh, when we go to the field now in fact Karnataka we have been able to we have built over 200,000 such pond ponds so much of water is now stored at surface of course they use a small pump to uh, lift the water from that uh, pond, but that pond is only 10 feet deep, so we, you don't need so much energy, even with the half an HP per, or one HP uh, pump set, you will be able to uh, take water from there. And then, because again, necessity uh, becoming the mother of invention, uh, uh, <coughs> people have started using drip irrigation, slowly, slowly. It, is, it was actually very hard to sell drip when resources were there, when water was, uh, water was abundant. Now people have started using uh, drip. The other day in Chikmanapur, I saw a farmer who is uh, growing tree mulberry and uh, is using uh, used, discarded uh, one liter water bottle, your bisleri or your uh, water bottles, and then tying those water bottles to each tree and making a very small uh, pinhole uh, at the bottom of the uh, bottle. And he's actually physically filling up those bottles. And I asked him, how, how often do you do it? He said, every day I do. So, uh, over, uh, I think it's a one acre plantation, some uh, 500, 600 plants are there. So, he uh, uh, takes wastewater from, from his village and then he uh, goes and fills up each one of those uh, water bottles. And that drips water very slowly and it irrigates the uh, tree mulberry and he's very happy. Uh, with, uh, uh, with, the, with the output. So this is a very uh, simple innovation that has, has come about. But can we really market it? Can we make it into productize it? And that kind of a uh, push is really not there. When you go to the place, uh, to, uh, and then there is another innovation again from a water perspective, uh, they are using drums actually. They use a large drum and place it at a slightly elevated place and then they fill it once uh, when electricity is there because electricity is also not available throughout the day. When electricity is there they fill the two three drums and from the drum they again drip water into the, uh, uh, the crops, uh, particularly tree crops like mulberry or, uh, or grapes. So there is a lot of scope for innovation and innovation does happen in the villages. However, this innovation doesn't really go to the market, it doesn't become a product, it doesn't get, uh, it doesn't get multiplied, it doesn't get sustained. So this is, uh, <clears throat> these are the areas that we uh, really need to think uh, the entrepreneurs, policy makers, uh, activists, NGOs, all of us need to think in terms of uh, how do we really make life easy for the poor and life less burdensome for the poor and at the same time uh, if 
if they can save energy and if they can uh, uh, use that uh, saved energy in physical energy, hard labor, and use the time to uh, to do something else. We have been trying to do uh, tackle indoor air pollution for a long time. Uh, so we tried uh, smokeless chula. But this one uh, case study we need to really look at because the smokeless chulas, uh, which is basically uh, smokeless stoves, cook stoves, uh, a lot of energy went into uh, creating these smokeless uh, stove programs during the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, it's 150 to 200 rupees it used to cost then when I was uh, in the field to build a small uh, smokeless uh, stove and uh, it was actually it would produce less smoke and it would be more efficient again somewhere I have not been able to understand why this has not really why did it take to scale we because whenever there is a subsidy people would say okay there is a subsidy of another 100 rupees 150 rupees people would build a smokeless uh, chula but it never uh, it, it never took off we were not able to uh, take the scale but now that LPG is becoming universal people are uh, getting LPG connections uh, 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 everyone is getting LPG connections the other day I asked a, uh, a daily wage laborer I visited a house which we had built under uh, our housing program so she is a daily wage laborer she has uh, uh, she uses LPG. So people are using LPG and now the domestic uh, environment has become smokeless. So that is one innovation that really didn't take off. That even though there are, uh, it was possible to uh, build a smokeless uh, stove, you could put up a uh, chimney, uh, basically a simple uh, cement pipe which would take uh, the smoke out of uh, the house. For some reason it didn't really uh, take off. We need to really think that as you are saying celebration of failure or at least if not celebration, uh, Diagnosis of failure as to why didn't some, some technologies really uh, 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 upscale, why didn't they really sell, uh, multiply and uh, I had gone to China once uh, again to look at the programs and then they had somehow upscaled uh, smokeless uh, chulas, 125 million households had got chulas. They were able to uh, get the market players into it and then the people are what, uh, able to sell uh, low cost uh, uh, smokeless uh, chulas to the people and then uh, they had somehow succeeded in building 125 million smokeless stoves uh, in rural Chinese homes. We have not been able to do that and now we have solved the problem uh, by using LPG. But again, LPG is a costly um, uh, is a costly resource, and one cylinder. So people actually use it very sparingly. I asked uh, this lady how much, uh, how, how many days does the cylinder last? In, in, I was surprised. She said it lasts seven three months. So which means that she was really sparingly using it because in our household, actually almost every 20 25 days we replace the uh, cylinder. So these are very random. Thoughts that I have um, shared with you, which uh, establish connections between uh, energy, livelihoods, ecosystem, environment, and resources. Policy uh, planners, uh, program implementers really need to look at this from a very holistic perspective. How do you re and then water? How do you really save water uh, instead of letting it go into the ground? It has to go into the ground for recharge equipment, but some of it can really enter the surface so that you upgrade the need to lift it again uh, using energy. Number one, how can we promote uh, crops and uh, uh, which, which, which use less water? Tree mulberry, for example, uses 30% less water than uh, regular mulberry. Uh, rice, which is cultivated through SRI systems, the situational rice improvement systems, uses 30%, only 30% of water that uh, regular flood uh, irrigated uh, rice uses. So in agricultural systems, can we uh, look at promoting such crops and such crop technologies which use less and less water? The crop using less water, number one. Number two, innovating and uh, bringing in new technologies to apply less and less water without wasting it. Because generally traditional way is to flood irrigation. When you do flood irrigation, actually 60 to 70 percent of water actually gets goes down into the ground and only crops use only 30 percent of water <coughs> whereas if you use a drip irrigation with only one-third of uh, 
the autumn you were earlier using you are able to uh, you are able to grow crops and the yield of yields are also better so energy saving water saving technologies approaches uh, should be should be promoted and that is the only way we can uh, we can go forward if you are uh, looking at uh, both sdg 7 and sdg 8 access to energy you have to provide access to energy and for that you have to look at uh, non polluting and uh, uh, not non climate change impacting uh, impacting uh, fuels but then there is nothing like if you uh, move uh, railways from electricity uh, from diesel to electricity but even electricity is uh, generated by burning coal and then uh, and if you want to move away from uh, burning coal and other fossil fuels to generate electricity then you have to look at solar and the solar energy also uses panels and the panels use resources there are a lot of connections uh, and it's it, it's a complex complex uh, subject but yes we need to move towards a, a sustainable uh, uh, sustainable uh, way of getting our energy number one number two use our energy more efficiently for using that energy more efficiently how can we look at systems technologies particularly those which are used uh, uh, by the poor but used by a larger uh, base of the pyramid uh, so that they can use less energy and therefore save money. They can use less water and save money and save energy and save effort and also uh, create uh, benefits to the ecosystem. How can we plant more trees which can, uh, which can produce more, more biomass which also has a market. Uh, we have a small biofuel project uh, where we use congamia seeds to uh, generate uh, uh, diesel actually, you, you can uh, blend it with uh, diesel, it becomes a bioethanol. And that program also, we are struggling to really take it to scale. We have set up almost 15 to 20 uh, biodiesel plants around the, the state in Karnataka with the help of government money. Uh, but that diesel, uh, we are not able to really market, we are not able to create a product and uh, market. So, but we are working or we are thinking in terms of uh, you know linking livelihoods to uh, to waste management because again solid waste disposal is a huge problem we are, uh, we are uh, you go to villages we uh, i'm not talking about cities because i'm a rural development secretary in villages if you also bangalore of course it's a different story uh, it's the same story even in villages on the roadside you see plastics being littered so if we are able to again connect livelihoods to uh, collecting uh, dry waste and recycling, uh, re recycling it, we are able to provide employment to some women's circle groups. We are trying to do that, and but that needs again innovation, that needs uh, market, and uh, that needs a lot of effort that that is uh, going into it. And then that is the work uh, that uh, we can do with uh, involvement with organizations uh, like Sarko and others. Other, other partners. So uh, I will uh, close my uh, remarks here. I'm sorry I, I, if I'm rambling. But uh, these are issues uh, which uh, we are uh, keenly aware in government and uh, we are trying to uh, focus attention on uh, resources and use the resources more sustainably. We are trying to link and establish, the, uh, be aware of the connections and the linkages between these uh, systems that I just talked, spoke about. Uh, we have a National Rural Livelihoods Mission under which we are uh, promoting women's circle groups. Circle groups are being federated and, the federa and those federations are being provided skills. And, the, and those federations, we have to link them to technologies which are energy efficient and which address issues of uh, rural waste management, address issues of uh, uh, water saving, uh, address issues of uh, rural livelihoods, uh, which actually also help them productize the, uh, the, uh, their skills, which they apply to rural products, and then again connect biomass uh, to energy and water. These are the programs, these are the uh, ideas that we are really working on. That view, but where we lack is uh, skills uh, at the managerial level, skills to connect these people to the market. Human resource to connect these people to the market is actually missing. We may have money, but we don't have people who can really come and work with us uh, in, in, in these issues. Uh, so therefore, in fact, we are uh, 
I was actually thinking of, of putting out an open uh, invitation saying that please come and work with us. Or please take a sabbatical. Uh, people who have passed out of IIMs can take a sabbatical and work with us and look at look at these issues. Look at rural markets where we can um, uh, create a market-driven system where we create products with, where and we, we create markets. So uh, I am glad that you are gathered here to look at these issues and uh, uh, it was good to connect with Harish and Steve after a long time and uh, uh, thank you for calling me here uh, to share some of my thoughts and then uh, uh, more than my speech I would uh, look forward to really working with experts because what I have done is I have basically put the problems on the table. I have not really proposed solutions. Solutions are something that can come uh, from interventions and from discussions such as this. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, uh, for, uh, for giving us and challenging to the crowd. I, I, I'm sure uh, this crowd will solve it in two days. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, so, uh, but you also put up some challenges that how do we scale up innovation? I think the next speaker is the right person to uh, help us uh, because he is uh, the head of uh, the Atal Innovation Mission of uh, under the India Government of India, which is responsible for setting up multiple Atal Innovation Centers across the country. Uh, while you can see his resume is from the top management of TCS, uh, who left then TCS to join the government. So you have challenged that many um, people should take sabbatical. I think he and his peak of his career actually not sabbatical, but to make sure that the mission of innovation. I hope, sir, the challenges that uh, Atik Sab has given, um, that through the other innovation centers, the, the answer of innovation for the poor, the scale up issues. And uh, I think somebody who has, uh, if, you, if you think of uh, a government office in, in Delhi, and if you have a picture in your in your mind, you should go to his office and you'll have a different picture of what a government office should actually look like. So please. Mm -hmm. Office in, in Delhi. And if you have a picture in your in your mind, you should go to his office and you'll have a different picture of what a government office should actually look like. So please. Mm -hmm. Respected uh, Professor Raghuram, uh, Shri Atik Ji, Principal Secretary, uh, Harish, good friend, distinguished ladies and gentlemen in the audience, and young innovators who are all out there uh, eagerly looking for how they can contribute to the growth of our nation and for the growth of the world. We are all here today uh, to deliberate and to discuss on a topic that is very, very important to every one of us in this room a topic that is very, very important for everyone in the globe. We are talking about SDG 7 and 8, uh, which is the focus on sustainable livelihood and uh, clean energy. They are just two of the 17 goals that were set up by the United Nations in 2015, where a group of 193 global leaders came together and committed to the betterment of the world. A world in which there would be no poverty. A world in which there would be equality. A world in which human rights would be respected, irrespective of gender, irrespective of whether they come from the metros or the big cities, whether they come from the large countries or the poor countries, irrespective of their background, irrespective of caste, creed, and color. And these translated themselves into 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals to be achieved by 2030 with 169 specific targets against each of these goals, against all these goals and 232 indicators to help you measure your progress against these goals. So it was not abstract thinking, it was not academic thinking. It was based on the harsh realities of the world that we live in. A world, the only planet that we live in. There was no plan B for this UN Sustainable Goals 
because there is no other planet to have a plan B. And therefore, this topic of sustainable development goals, and in particular SDG 7 and 8, which is of great relevance to India, and which requires every one of, in the, of, of us in this room and beyond to be aware of. How many of us in this room are aware of all the 17 sustainable development goals? How many of us in this 1.3 billion country of ours are familiar with the need for ensuring that these sustainable development goals are met, not only for their own benefit, but for the benefit of the future generations? How many of the 1.4 million school students who are out in this country <coughs> study 1.4 million schools, 640,000 of them higher secondary schools, the generation of tomorrow, the students, the job creators, the employers, the job seekers of tomorrow, how many of them are familiar with what these sustainable development goals mean and what does it mean from their perspective? How many of our 10,500 engineering institutions in our country who are going to create the jobs of tomorrow and who are going to ride the 101.4 billion people are going to ride on what these 150 million students who are entering into the workplace are going to be doing because upon them rides the hopes of this billion people and upon these people these youngsters who are out there in the world growing rides the hopes of 7 billion people on this planet so it is very important for us to look at this topic and internalize it study it absorb it and make it a part of what we do every day because unless the mindset of all of us change we can talk and have these conferences and feel good but nothing is going to come out of it and unless we innovate and unless we become entrepreneurs and unless we translate all of these objectives and so wonderfully laid out the challenges by Sri Atik and we don't address them we would have failed in our job and that is what as a mission director of Athan Innovation Mission we are seized we are seized with this problem and we are seized with how to find a solution for all of this so the other innovation mission is because the others have talked about the topic and the need and the importance of all of this, I'm going to focus on what we are trying to do in order to actually solve this problem. So the mission's focus is very simple. How do I create and promote an ecosystem of innovation and an ecosystem of entrepreneurship across the length and breadth of this country so that we are going to ensure that the world of tomorrow is possible, is a sustainable world, a world where the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals are actually going to be lived and to be met. How do we ensure that the 1.4 million school students who are living in a world where technology is advancing at a rapid pace, where it is changing the way you are experiencing the world, where it is changing the way the world is experiencing you. How do we make sure that these young students in schools are abreast of the latest technologies like 3D printing, robotics, IoT devices, miniaturized electronics, augmented virtual reality, you name it, artificial intelligence, blockchain, how are they going to get familiar so that when they grow up, they can become the innovators of tomorrow and create the solutions that are so desperately needed in this world of ours. How do we also ensure that our great innovators, our great thinkers, our great scientists, our great engineers don't run to the United States and to the advanced economies in pursuit of a job but can remain here because they find an ecosystem of innovation, they find an ecosystem of entrepreneurship which can help them realize their dreams, help them blossom to their full potential, help them reach the dreams that they have and help them feel that they have actually contributed to the progress of humanity. That is what the other innovation mission is all about. And so how are we going about doing this? We are starting fundamentally with a holistic approach. If you don't have a holistic approach in this, you are going to be addressing the problem partly. So the holistic approach means, how do you, at a school level, how do you create a problem solving, innovative mindset in school students? You see, these are going to be the entrepreneurs and the innovators of tomorrow. All that you are hearing here and the expectations are 
that these are going to these students are going to innovate the young innovators are going to create the solutions that the farmer needs that the rural entrepreneur needs that the uh, uh, fruit producer needs that uh, somebody who is uh, bothered about waste management needs they are we are going to be the solution providers and we have a fantastic opportunity why do i say that india is a country where 1.150 million students are going to enter the workplace we have what is called as a demographic dividend we have more than 65 percent of our country under 35 years old we have a youthful energy and a force that is the enemy of many a country across the world they are all looking at india and saying wow you have this fantastic energy what are you going to do with it i'm not talking about it. these are the highest examples of renewable energy our people our assets who are going to be the force of change so number one we have that advantage number two we are also one of the fastest growing economies in the world with 7.5 to 8 percent growth in our gdp we are again the envy of many a country because we have growth possibilities number three we have a a student body and a student force which has proved itself in the knowledge economy of the world we have been great job seekers we have had the great ability to absorb through our road learning and through all the universities who have educated us and i'm a product of that we have, we have been able to create an impact on the knowledge economy of the world 180 billion dollar it and ITS, industry, ITS industry has sprung up from this very nation this nation of job seekers the nation of intellectual horsepower that is that is unequaled in many other countries so we have these advantages but at the same time we are also living in a world which is another big advantage we are living in a world where technology is advancing so rapidly and advances in computing communications storage is enabling the cost of innovation to become zero you have unlimited, unlimited storage today you have unlimited communications the cost of communication is coming down rapidly because of advances in mobile technologies, wireless technologies, broadband technologies, satellite technologies. The cost of computing is coming down tremendously because of advances in computing. And we have new technologies like artificial intelligence, blockchain, IoT, sensor technologies, which are all coming together and converging together to create the solutions that a country like India needs and that the world needs in order to meet the United Nations Sustainable Goals. And so, what we are doing at a school level, we have launched what are known as thousands of utter tinkering labs. These tinkering labs are dedicated innovation workspaces in every school that has applied and got 20 lakhs of grant from the government of India. And these schools, in these schools, the children are exposed to these latest technologies like 3D printers, robotics, IoT, innovation and electronics, augmented virtual reality, do-it-yourself kits. So this do it yourself case, we are introducing the children to the art and the capability of problem solving and developing an innovative mindset. We don't want them to focus only on getting good marks and getting into good universities, get good marks again and go into another university abroad and get good marks again and get into a job in Google, IBM, PCS, Pro, and so on. We want them to become potential job creators. And to become potential job creators, you have to start looking at the world around you identify problems around you, find solutions for the problems around you using the technologies that are being made available at an affordable cost today. We can be the bedrock of frugal innovations for the rest of the world. And we should be, because India has 22% of our country below the poverty line. We still have 40% of our country at the economy base. The challenges in our country is not of having a smart home, but to have an affordable home. The challenge of a country is not to have a smart car, but to have transportation availability and a road on which a bullock cart and a car can travel. These are the challenges that afflict us. And these are the very challenges that technology can help solve. So we have a great opportunity. An opportunity where we have intellectual horsepower, we have a growing economy, we have a technology base which is advancing rapidly, and we have millions of challenges. What better combination can we have? And therefore, if all of us don't take an effort, either at the school level, or at the university level, or at the industry level, to identify these challenges and be able to solve them, we would have failed in our class. So what do we do for the Atal Tinkering Lab school students? We have today launched 8,000 Atal Tinkering Labs 
across the schools in the last two years. The effect has been amazing. We tell the children, when you come from your home to your school, look at the world around you. Identify a problem. Converge together with three or four students. Look at your tinkering technologies. Create a prototype of a solution and demonstrate the solution to the rest of the world. We ran an adult tinkering marathon last year in December, where more than 50,000 school students between grade 6 to grade 12 participated and created prototype of innovations. 8,000 innovations got created. 1,500 of them got submitted to other innovation mission for final consideration. We have shortlisted the top 200. We have put it up on our website. If you look at those innovations, you will be amazed. You will have innovations which are equal, some of them are equal to what is happening from our IITs and maybe even at Stanford. That is the power of exposing technology and a problem solving methodology to young students irrespective of their age. And that is where we are trying to bring the chain to make sure that we get the innovators, the entrepreneurs, to address the very problem that Sri uh, Ati mentioned. How do we solve solar panel based irrigation management system? An eight standard girl in Tutupuri, which is a remote part of the country, and you can see this video on the Atharva Innovation Mission website. An eight standard girl along with her friends have created a solar panel IoT based, drip based irrigation management system for precision agriculture for the people in the farm because they are deprived of water. Another student from Sikkim, girl students, have created a robotic base management system. And these are the type of innovations that are happening at the schools. So I hope that out of these school students come great innovators, the future Steve Jobs from India, the future Facebook or the Google companies type in India who are based on the reality of solving problems for our country. Because in solving problems for our country, you solve problems for the rest of the world. And that is the objective. The objective is to create the next breed of generation of innovators and entrepreneurs who will enter into universities. So what is the next thing that we are doing at Athel Innovation Mission? At the university level and at the institutional level and, at, and in social enterprises or NGOs like uh, the Selco Foundation, we are helping set up world-class incubators. We have launched 101 world-class incubators across the country in the last two years. And these incubators are supposed to foster startups. Startups that can provide the solutions and the jobs for solving national economic and social problems. It is not just economy, because linked with economy is social growth and social equity. And we want to make sure that this combination goes together. And therefore, these 101 incubators would be launching 5,000 startups over the next four years. Each incubator would launch 25 startups every two years and make them successful. It is not just launching. The reason you have an incubator is because startups have values of debt. And these values of debt are at different points in the life cycle. So a great idea does not become a great product. And therefore, the incubators provide the support and the shelter and the umbrella shelter that is required in order for the startups to succeed. We give a grant of 10 crores for every successful applicant who wants to be an incubator. We of course validate the business plan of the incubator. We validate the commitment. We even validate the CEOs who are going to be part of that. Because we don't want this to be a grant making exercise or a money distribution exercise. We want real startups, world class startups, world class incubators who will create a ding in the universe as Steve Jobs said. Create an impact and we want them to create the impact in India we want that impact to resonate across in the rest of the world. Where are we on this journey? 43 incubators of ours are already operational. More than 500 startups are operational in the last one year. And we are sure that within the next 3-4 years, we will have 5,000 startups. The third intervention that we are doing is we have launched what are known as Athil New India Challenges. These New India Challenges are specific challenges that we arrive at by working along with the ministries and the industry. And through these challenges, to the innovators of India, not restricted to the incubators or the startups that we have started, but to the entire country. So with five of the ministries, the Ministry of Drinking, Water and Sanitation, the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Rain, the Ministry of Transportation, and the Ministry of Urban Housing and Development, we have launched 24 challenges, 950 applications of real products that can potentially have an impact came to us. We are selecting 50 of them for funding with one crore of grant 
so that they can take this product or a prototype or a patented innovation into a commercially deployable product. And that we are going to launch a hundred new challenges during this year. And each of these would hopefully create products which will have real impact. Now the issue is not just giving this as a challenge and then somebody going and showing on the website, I won this challenge. That is not the objective. The objective is with that challenge you create a product. With that product you create a company and that company would have the benefit of being attached to the incubators and the startup world that we are creating. And we want to make sure that we are there as a lifetime partner in that journey of the startup and the winner. And the fourth intervention that is happening at this point in time as we speak and which will be launched in the month of July is creating what is known for the MSME industry, the equivalent of the SBIR industry in the United States. The SBIR is a small business innovation and research initiative in the United States. 70% of new businesses and employment gets generated by small businesses in the United States. And we want to make sure in a country like India, where we have, it's not enough for the Tatas and the Bildas and the existing companies to employ the 150 million students who will be entering into the workplace. We have to create this ecosystem where MSME industry, young innovators, three to four person companies can blossom and become into larger companies and hire more people. So the M the, the A arrives, the other research and innovation for small enterprises will be launched in July. We are hoping hundreds of challenges along with all the ministries. This, this will be owned by the ministries. So the ministries will launch the challenge with the help of our innovation mission in order to solicit research as well as innovation in the specific areas that this country needs. Now in order to make all of this happen, we have created a mentors network because without mentoring, you're not going to succeed. Without the private participation, without corporates riding hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder with the government, without the global academia participating in this initiative, we will not succeed and even countries. So towards that end, we are building a network of partnerships. The first, we have built a mentoring network across India and I would urge every one of you to apply and become a mentor, either to a tinkering lab or to an incubator or to a startup. To date, we have had 10,000 people who are registered voluntarily as mentors from the professional community, be it from the IBMs, the Googles, the PCS, the Wipros, uh, the HPs, and so on. And 3,800 of them have already got allocated to Atlantic Tinkering Lab, and they will be also allocated to incubators and startups. We need this participation. And many countries are partnering now with other innovation mission. Just yesterday, I was with UNICEF in Delhi where we launched a partnership along with UNICEF to see how UN Sustainable Development Goals are aligned with every innovation that is happening in the school across the country. And with the United Nations, we launched a set of challenges a couple of months ago where we were able to uh, harness the power of innovation at the school level as well as at the university level. All of these are in order to make sure that we address the problems that we are talking about. We have a major, major issue on our hand, and that is the planet that we live in is running out of oxygen. And if we are not aware that we have to do our bit, and as somebody, as Harish said, every year it becomes a little bit warmer, every year it becomes a little bit harsher, every year we find the air a little more difficult to breathe, every year we find that the water is not so clean, we have to recognize this problem, and we have to use technology, the economy, social impact, psychology, all of these have to come together, liberal arts, technology, everything has to come together in order to address this problem. And I'm sure we can. We have, in our country, the unique opportunity. We missed the opportunity in the last industrial revolution that swept the world in the last century. We missed the boat. But we have an opportunity this century to become the leaders and show the world what India is capable of. We want a thousand Abdul Kalams, a thousand Swami Vivekananda's, and a thousand Steve Jobs type of people, Google, Satya Nadala, and, and Sundar Pichai, to blossom here and convert this country into a leader for the world. Thank you so much. For the audience, we have the problems that uh, Atik Saab said. We have the ecosystem that the government has laid out, Ramana sir has so articulately said. So it's now for us to be the middle gap and fill 
the problem, uh, solve the problem using the ecosystem that that Mr. Ramanan has actually so clearly laid out. So in two days, uh, hopefully we deliberate and make sure that at least some part that we are able to answer back to both Mr. Ati and Mr. Ramanan that something has come out of this workshop. Both have created, I mean, one has a policy of, of in terms of being the rural development secretary and, and laid out the challenge and has showed us that the government is with us and for us. Mr. Ramanan has laid out there are enough opportunities from the government side to for innovation, monies from mentorship to uh, to innovation, uh, uh, the classical innovation that is required for rural India. So now it's up to us. We have no room, absolutely no room for two things: complaints and excuses. I think it's high time to step up and 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 take this challenge. And hopefully in these two days we'll take it. So I now I hand it back to my colleagues. Thank you, sir. And also, uh, thank you, Sri uh, Raghuram, Sri uh, Atit, sir, and uh, Sri R. Ramanan, sir. Uh, as part of uh, expressing our gratitude, we'd like our, our colleagues to uh, represent the small sovereign.